welcome back to the show, returning champion, Heather Hale. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing, Heather? In the right corner. <laughs> okay, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for so much for coming back. You are a busy bee. So now you're back with your, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your second book, Story Selling, but you were an uh, original guest on Indie Film Hustle in episode 240, talking about how to work the markets. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you were a big hit. A lot of people liked, uh, loved that episode. So when I heard about your new book, I was like, well, we got to have Heather back to talk about this because if out of, out of, yeah. Just for my own personal, I just have so many questions. So I'm, di- I'm dying to ask. So for, for people who don't know who you are and didn't listen to that first episode, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into the film business? Um, yeah. So I'm a writer, director, producer, film and television. And I have about five broken stories because everybody has to break in and re-break in and re-break in. So larceny, I think larceny. I'm about to do my next one. Yeah. <laughs> So I, my, I guess my big break in was, uh, the courage to love, which was a five and a half million dollar lifetime original movie that Vanessa Williams, Stacey Peach, Gil Bellows and Diane Carroll was in. That's the big one. I got and you. Then I, I, I did a bunch of other little things like, um, a couple PBS series that won Emmys and, uh, lifestyle magazine that I'm still doing. That's a, a TV talk show that won some tellies and, uh, ACE awards and just lots of. I did a lot of infomercials, commercials, trade, industrials, you name it. So you, you've been hustling. You've been hustling. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about um, selling your story. So how, do, how does one, uh, well, what advice do you have to develop a marketable story or screenplay or project? Well, that's a, a loaded question. It I is. <laughs> It depends on where you're at in the process. It depends on where you're at in your career. It depends on the kind of project. So that's a pretty broad question, but it's, of course, a question everybody has. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think a huge part of it is knowing what your concept is and knowing who would buy it and who would watch it. So what are your distribution channels? Is it a limited event series? Is it a contained thriller or an an indie feature? Is it an indie feature? Is it um, something that could be a one-hour drama, comedy, sketch comedy? What What is this monster that you're selling? And then who are the likely buyers or the prospects that would be contenders for financing, distribution, attachments, actors, directors? Who are the people that could come on board as part of that daisy chain that get the momentum going to get it pushed up the hill? I, I think I said this in the last time. I feel like Sisyphus the octopus just pushing like <laughs> eight rocks up the hill. So... That's how I always feel. But in, so I think it's it's being able to identify what the gem of the concept is mm-hmm. and who's going to care. Who's going to care enough to fund millions or pay 12 bucks? Like who's going to care and want to see that and how do you get it to them? And what's the best way to, to pitch it to them? And that can work pretty much on almost any level. I mean, even if it's a small micro budget film, you're, yep. you're, you're just pitching it to somebody who you want to work for very little on the movie. It could be a DP. It could be an actor that you want to bring on board. It could be anybody. Or it could or be you your money. Mo- shoot in their restaurant. Mm-hmm. Or you want them to donate Gatorade. Like whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's all it's all part of the same thing. Everyone always thinks that you have to sell your story or selling uh, your story is or your project is all about millions and millions of dollars and getting, you know, Steven Spielberg to executive produce. Yes, there are those, but more likely it's like going down to the local pizza joint that you talk to all the time. Like, look, this is what I'm doing and getting yeah. and, and those skills that you have to kind of build. Yeah. Uh, can your... I use your restaurant after hours? Would you give us a really good deal on your cameras? <laughs> Whatever you need, beg, borrow, steal everything and getting that star to come for one day, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's pitching it in the best light possible and angling it so that your approach strategy is appropriate for whoever it is, whatever it is you're asking for from whoever that prospect is. Well, let me ask you a question. When I, when I first started, my very first short film that I did, uh, I, I turned it into kind of like I was a nobody with no, no real background other than shooting a few commercials. This is years ago. And I was trying to put together a small short film, which was going to be around an $8,000 short film in Florida. And I made it into this kind of I, I even at that the, the, this book, of course, wasn't available then. Uh, and a lot of these concepts weren't even talked about back then. Yeah. But 
I, I read I, it because I needed to read it 20 years ago, too. So right. Like, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I would have loved to read this 20 years ago. Yeah. So, but what I did was, you know, because I was like, I'm a nobody from nowhere and I got to put together a team to make this movie. So what I did is made it kind of like an extravaganza in a sense, like it's a really big, ambitious action film with a lot of visual effects. And I started getting artwork commissioned to make it look good. And I just started building up a bigger a bigger thing than it was. I was treating it like it was an X-Men movie. You know, yeah. like I was I was treating it like a real big budget movie, even though it was a small movie. And that attracted talent to the piece because nobody else in my area was doing anything like that. Perception is reality, right? <laughs> exactly. So is that kind of a good plan? Because I know a lot of people listening might have a short little short film or a little micro budget film and to kind of create this kind of buzz about it and kind of create like, well, I want to be a part of that craziness. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, everyone wants to be a part of the next great thing. Everyone wants to not have missed out. It's like that FOMO, fear of missing out. If mm -hmm. you were the one who who didn't get that opportunity. I have a friend who was next door neighbors with Bill Gates. And when Bill Gates was a kid, he asked him for $4,000 to buy his first computer. And he said, no. Mm. So, you know, we all have mm. missed the boat. I was just listening to the Jim Patterson masterclass. And he said, 39 people turned yeah. down his first novel. Yeah, yeah. And the truth is, are those 39 people wrong? Maybe. But 39 people who are supposedly professionals in the industry missed the boat on being the publisher for James Patterson. Mm -hmm. So you need people to think you're the next big thing. And even if you're not the next big thing, like the hot ingenue or whatever, that that project might be Indie Spirit Award worthy, Sundance Buzz worthy. Is it going to be like you look at distributors and of course, distributors want to see A-list talent. But they also love to see a good stable, an ensemble of solid talent where they know that the, the bar of acting ability is going to be raised to that level or that the DP or the costume designer, whoever the key, key department heads are, that those are rock solid people. So if you can create this ensemble around you that you're the weak link in the constellation, you're going to be able to pitch um, the strength of your team and kind of <clears throat> try to parlay some t traction off of that, uh, off, off everybody's communal efforts. Is it, isn't it true, though? Like, I've seen so many, and I've done it myself, so many projects pitched up around, you know, really high-end, um, be below-the-line people, yeah. like really excellent editors, really excellent DPs who have, they're like, really... Yeah. yeah, they're the really... But that gives <laughs> you, like, as a young filmmaker or an inexperienced filmmaker, they're like, look, I'm, I have the vision... But these are my craftsmen. These are the people who are going to execute my vision. So at least at minimum, you know, it's going to look and sound and look good. And, and so that make investors and even studios sometimes, depending on what type of studio it is, a little bit happier, right? Yeah, you've surrounded yourself with people who are going to make sure that you deliver good quality. Same thing with your, if you're an actor or an actress trying to write yourself a role and put up the money and buy yourself the role, you know, that is a strategy that works for lots of people. Surround yourself with the best of everything. You know, make, you know, let yourself be the weak. I always think you should be the, the weakest player on the bench, you know, then mm -hmm. so your game is always raised to the players around you. So just make sure you get the very best you can secure and then pitch your heart out of, look at all these great people that you couldn't have afforded, but I've got at this scale because they all want to help me. And it isn't it true as well that when you land that one actor, or that one key person below the line, mm -hmm. they are the ones that nobody wants yeah. to be the first to the party. <laughs> so yeah, same thing with money. No one wants to be first money in. They all want to be first money out. It's tough. You know, you can often get second and third money, but who's the first to jump in the pool? Would it, and I don't know if this is even legal or not, but let's say your mom and dad are going to invest in your in your business. Can you just say, we have investors already. We already have money we'll in. We'll do that all the time. I know someone who has half a million and he or she told me behind the scenes, it's mom and dad, you know, who, nobody, it's confidence. It's just all smoke and mirrors, you know, and it's not just smoke and mirrors. I mean, you want to you want to take care of anyone else's money like it was your own. Mm -hmm. And you're going to take care of mom and dad's money because that's not, not so your own in retirement or your own inheritance, but it's your parents. So I think you just, you want everyone to know that you honor the fiduciary relationship that you have and that you're going to do the very best you can in every department, in every element and make everyone have faith and confidence in you. And you got to pitch and pitch and pitch your heart out every which way.
Now let's talk a little bit about screenwriters because I know screenwriters unfortunately have the worst worst luck to have to pitch their their wares, and many yeah. times they don't have those visual yeah. stimulation uh, or videos or ripomatics or yeah. any of those things. What are the biggest mistakes you see screenwriters when they're pitching their scripts? Well, I have a lot of ideas for that, and I also think that times have changed. So they used to say, don't use any key art when you're pitching a screenplay. Um, that's sort of true, sort of not true. We talked about this in the, the other book, uh, How to Work the Markets. But basically, don't use shitty key art. Right? <laughs> Fair that's enough. It, right? Because most of what comes is awful. So it's okay to use key art. It's also okay to turn down the 12 students who want you to use their key art and use nothing. As a writer, I, I, I worked on projects where um, I was a judge of a bunch of competitions, and the people came in, and what the writer, the creator pitched verbally and on the page was so much better than the chintzy budget that they could swing for some trailer or sizzle reel. Like, you know, don't, don't, if it's not fantastic, don't give that because your words should be able to sing. You're a writer. That's what he expects you to be a fantastic writer. Mm -hmm. The reverse is true as well. I've seen lots of slick, beautiful, high-end ad agency quality pitch decks and sizzle reels where the idea wasn't good, right? Mm -hmm. it, the story wasn't there. The characters were no good. It wasn't fresh. It wasn't original. So people can see through that. So as a writer, just write the best stuff you can. So then beyond that, you can use things like, you don't have to have a photo shoot. You can use things like unsplash.com and there's a ton mm -hmm. of others that's free images. So just get the image that captures some beautiful photographer who's done it for free and given it to you. Also, you can use any image you want in a pitch deck, right? It's not going, you're not selling it. It's not necessarily going on the internet. And even if it goes on the internet, it can be password protected. So you can grab images off other things. And that's, you know, another thing people can do, what's called a ripomatic. Instead of shooting a short film and editing your proof of concept for your feature film or your TV show, grab images of A-list stars with the kind of production value you're wanting to communicate, and then just do a voiceover that kind of unifies it. So it's telling your story. And they know that the Brad Pitt that changes even to Will Smith, that changes to whomever, that that's the character we're tracking. And then they can visualize in their mind's eye an A-list actor with that kind of production value or don't worry about it. Just have it written, you know, on the written page or grab images. I, I've done things where wherever the set is, maybe it's Martha's Vineyard, maybe it's the Wild West, you grab images that conjure that sense of place and time and that milieu and then don't worry about the actors so much. I, I have a project where we have, it's an ensemble cast and of course we have whoever the hottie of the week is, male and female, right? Whoever they are. I'm not going to say who they are because they look at dated, but your veteran actors, some of your character actors, those are some of the anchors that you know maybe you're going to stunt cast a cameo for a day or two. So maybe in your fantasy you get Francis McDormand and Kevin Costner. All right, cool. And then we'll cast whoever the stars are, you know, but those are the anchor that are going to let you know the caliber of acting involved. Yeah, I, I've edited many a ripomatic in my day for clients where and it's a it's a kind of a it's, it's an art form first of all, but also Total art form. Yeah. but it's but it's also something that not many people even know about. It's not a very yeah. known thing a ripomatic where I literally would go to you know Seven and Fight Club and I would because it was a dark yep. thriller esque thing and I would just grab images of Brad Pitt and I actually carried Brad Pitt through multiple movies in yeah. the trailer. And there's a lot yep. of those kind of things like these faux trailers on YouTube now that they do for fun. But I it's... have a ton on my website. So I have heatherhale.com forward slash story selling. Mm -hmm. And I have ripomatic examples and any that you have, that you, I'll put tons more up there. So I keep trying to put things that are good examples. So, and there are lots of, and the faux ones are fantastic because if, if you've ever seen the the trailers that take something like The Shining and turn it into romantic Co comedy. Oh, those are the best. Right? <laughs> but look at what it teaches you about images and music. juxtaposition of images and music and lighting. Like you lighten it up to a different color palette and suddenly it's not The Shining anymore. Or you take some, you know, Wes Anderson thing and make it gritty, film noir-ish. Like that's how you can change what we think the genre is and who the target audience is. So I talk a lot about, in both books, reverse engineering from your comps, your film and television examples that are mm -hmm. similar 
or they have the same sensibility or same target audience? And what can you learn from their taglines, from their keywords? And are you pushing the boundaries in unique and interesting ways? Are you, are you um, colliding ideas so that what comes up is fresh and in your wheelhouse really specifically? And I think all of these marketing materials, whether they're on the, whether it's a pitch deck that's like a PowerPoint, whether it's a proposal in Microsoft Word or PDF, whether it's a sizzle reel or ripomatic, whatever, an animatic, all those things are just to communicate the idea that's in your mind's eye to kind of emulate the viewing experience for your prospect. Now, can you tell everybody, we just want to go down the line, what is a pitch deck so you can explain to people what a pitch deck is exactly? Uh, well, I'm, I think this is all changing all the time because we have a whole generation of students who can edit what 20, 30 years ago. I mean, it's just, it's a whole different world. And so we have a very visual, multimedia savvy, social media savvy generation, plus uh, veterans that have been in the business for a long time and have done things in a different way. So I'm not sure that anybody knows this exactly, but in the book, story selling especially, I really tried to say, here's what a synopsis is, here's what a summary is, here's what a logline is. You're going to hear a ton of different examples of what a treatment, scriptment, all these words. But pitch to me, when I think of pitch deck, I think of a deck of cards. And I think of a stack of images. So I think PowerPoint for pitch deck. That doesn't make it right or wrong. It can be saved as a PDF and sent in different ways. But I think image, image, image with very little writing in a pitch deck, right? I did a fantastic pitch deck for a project. And then they wanted to know what were the uh, episode synopses. They wanted all the words. After I went to all this effort to make this great image rich thing, I had to turn around and end up doing character breakdowns. Here's where the each um, episode would begin and end. Here's our cliff notes, I'm, I'm cliffhangers. So uh, to me, a pitch package is any one of these things. It's the package of the material. And a proposal might be more like a series Bible where you might have, here's a synopsis of the pilot. Here are the key episodes that we're going to talk about. If it's a limited series, you might have all of them. And so in the proposal, you're, you're putting everything and it's a proposal to someone. Mm -hmm. Is it to a product placement company? Is it to a director? Is it to a star? Is it to someone pay, playing a small supporting role that's really key and they're an A-lister and you're going after them and then you're going to pitch it. Like, I don't know if you've seen the new, I don't know if it's called Karate Kid, but the new Karate Kid series. Oh, you mean the co Cobra Kai? Cobra Kai. Yes, fantastic. They pitched that, right. But you know they pitched it wildly differently to each of those actors, right? Because to one actor, it was, uh, his chance, to, he was the victim. He was the one that had the illegal kick to the head, right? So it was totally pitched differently to each of them to get them to feel like they were the protagonists of their stories. Mm. Where and they, they, are, and they are. Yeah. So, so it's the same thing. If you're pitching to someone who's got a, fan, it's a fantastic bit part, but they're only in two episodes of maybe a 10 episode limited series, you're pitching that key role. None of the rest of it really matters because they're not even there. So you have to make sure that mm. it's what's in it for me and what's relevant to me about this. So it's cust you're custom making pitches per totally. person or, yeah. or person but, or thing. But honestly, 85 to 90 percent is the same, mm -hmm. right? You're just taking out some stuff and shifting it. So I've started doing pitch decks and proposals. And then some, I don't normally have the ability for a sizzle reel. I mean, I, I can do rip and things, but my editing skills are, are mm -hmm. on the upswing. <laughs> I'm acquiring them. Mm -hmm. So if I have someone on the team who's a great editor, that's fantastic. I grab images and I grab, I'll give like a, an AV time code script of here, well, this would be great. This clip, this clip, this clip, and here's how we could pull this together. But for my purposes, I can usually do it with, um, images I've grabbed off the internet, which, you know, I'm sure everybody knows, but right click and you can use it. You don't need rights. You don't need to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Get the highest reds you can and then, you know, make it smaller and wrap your text around it. And you can make a really beautiful presentation that really hits the high notes. And I, on the website, I have a bunch of examples of everything too. And we'll put those in the show notes without question. And then a sizzle reel, because that's also another mystery like a ribomatic. What is a sizzle reel exactly? Well, if you think of um, a trailer, the trailer for a movie, say, for example, is often, unfortunately, beginning, middle and end. And it gives away all the best moments and it ruins the spoilers, uh, right? Yeah. That's typical bad trailer, but it gets butts in the seats of the cinema. 
a trailer for, let's say, Jane the Virgin for this week will be this week. They're not going to tell you about the pilot. They're not going to tell you about the whole season. It's just what's coming up. So if you're, or Game of Thrones, whatever it is that you're, you know, binge watching, if you happen to be watching it weekly on, say, broadcast uh, television, it's this upcoming week, that, or the uh, like America's Got Talent. Here's who's in the semifinals. Whatever it is that's coming up, that's the trailer. A sizzle reel uh, might be the whole season. Here's the whole asset. that, we, Like if you were selling a TV show that you've put in a can, let's think like, like the dog whisperer, it might be clips of the whole five or 10 years or big bang theory. It might be, you know, they might be selling that to other countries and that sizzle reel is the whole season or the whole series or the whole anthology series. You think of true detective, American horror story. So it's not telling you what's coming up next week. It's not a, um, telling you the whole story like a trailer might or a trailer should tease. So there are all different ways of teasing. It's just how much content of the asset are they teasing. And even as I give you all those definitions, you know, they could all be wrong for a different kind of project. It's just, I think, I love the, the saying, sell the sizzle, not the steak. Mm-hmm. Right. You just, you just want to tease and intrigue them. So they want to come back. They want, they want to, it's like a log line is to get them to ask to read the script. If, if a log line gets them to ask to read the synopsis, Mm -hmm. they just asked for the second hurdle. Like you want to always go for the close. So you're trying to get them to ask to read the script, ask to see your, you know, your um, screener, ask to get to the next step. And if you can't get them to make that leap, what's the very best next thing that will hopefully keep driving towards your goal. Now, um, how do you construct the pitch? I know that's also a loaded question because it depends on what kind of pitch it is. But like, you know, let's say a screenwriter is going to go into a, into a, a pitch meeting with, uh, yeah. you know, a potential producer or studio. How do you construct, literally like construct the pitch? Like, because some, some of them will go in there and talk for 30 minutes. You're like, nope. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. how, how do you do it? And, and I talk a great deal in the book about different kinds of pitches, different kinds of projects, different environments. So the pitch for an on the studio lot meeting, an official pitch meeting that might be 30 minutes long, where everybody in the room has read your writer's Bible, your series Bible, they might have even read read the screenplay. Like Mm -hmm. sometimes you go in and you're pitching after the fact where everybody's read everything. And then other times you're doing a pitch fest event or virtual pitch fest thing where it's five minutes, it's a total stranger and you got to, you know, do your whole elevator pitch and don't even have time to build rapport. So I think it depends on what you're pitching. Character driven projects are going to be pitched quite differently than a plot driven project. Mm -hmm. A high concept project is going to be uh, quite differently pitched. Something that might be a a famous novel or um, a famous life story, somewhere where we have some point of reference that's going to be quite differently pitched than some original worldview of like a Juno Right? right. And it's it's a whole you have to know the world and the person. And so it depends on what it is you're pitching. Same thing with um, a pilot, a pilot for uh, whether it's a comedy or drama. It's going to be very much about that driving protagonist because it might be it's maybe a serial. It might be episodic. Who knows? But are we going to want to tune into this character week after week? And then in the book, I go through everything, including reality TV, game shows, documentaries, everything. So. Um, it, and it depends on too, do you know anything about the people you're pitching to? Sometimes who you're pitching to, you can Google them and you have a good feel for who's going to be in the room. I give strategies for how to find out who's going to be in the room. Sometimes you're completely prepared and who's in the room has changed by the time you get there. Like I, I had a deal <laughs> with NBC when, um, uh, Com- when Comcast was acquiring NBC universal. So I had a four year deal and you would go in and you, who you thought you were pitching to and you'd done all your research on was different. And I even went in and pitched one day and they had to call it off because of the stock shares and who was they were acquiring and they couldn't hear, oh, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Same thing with an investor. Are they legit? Are they real? Are they not? It's just sometimes hard to know who you're pitching to. So you want to make sure that you're prepared to kind of lead off with some top notes I often think of like an overture in a musical or an opera. It's like boom, 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 skipping a rock across the water so that they get a sense that there's going to be gunplay. There's going to be uh, some fight choreography. There's going to be this epic romance. 
we, we get a sense of the type of things we're going to be seeing. And then you do a deep dive into the character that you're pitching to, maybe the visuals and cinematics to a director, maybe why there's a great affinity target audience to an investor. It depends on what you're pitching to, why, um, who, and why. And that's another thing I talk about is the, like in journalism, the who, what, where, when, why, like think about those things. And so in the book, I did what I thought was a lot of fun, and I've had a lot of readers read it, and they loved it. I'm not tooting my own horn. I just was really thought every minute, what, what did I wish I had 20 years ago? What do storytellers need to have? And so I did all these work, uh, worksheets and spreadsheets, and here's how to break it down. I, I uh, have some stuff from Blake Snyder in there that would have to save mm-hmm. a cat and all the genres. And here's an approach for log lines. And if you don't like that, no worries. Here's how to break down a tagline. Here's how to use irony. Here's how all the different ways of going from log line to synopsis, to pitch deck, to video, it's all the different ways, because you might have to go backwards and forwards. And that's a big premise of the book is as you refine and hone your marketing materials, it becomes real glaring where your problems are in your script, right? <laughs> it becomes real clear. So you're rewriting and developing as you're marketing and as you're pitching. And when you pitch and people are confused, it's probably a problem in the script, you know, or a missed opportunity. When someone laughs when they're not supposed to, there's something, <laughs> there's a there's a gap they're waiting for that you you should go back and rewrite your script. And not that you should, you know, be influenced by all that, but, but it's um, it's not art until someone encounters it, right? Mm-hmm. So what you think is in your head might be quite different. Like I, I don't know if I told you this in the last one, but I had a, a thriller class you know, with Neil Hicks at mm-hmm. UCLA that I loved, and he gave us this exercise in class, and it was you know what do you want? So one character asked the other character, what do you want? And my brother, um, his wife had just come out of the closet, so this had rocked the world of our family. And so I wrote, you know, what do you want? A divorce. Because like, to me, it was this it was very melodramatic, poignant thing. So I wrote this, it was a little exercise, and I wrote a divorce, and I did this dialogue back and forth, and then he asked us to read it. So here's my family processing this challenging thing, and as I'm reading it, the class is in hysterics laughing, like it was a spoof mm-hmm. or comedy, and I was too embarrassed to, like, I could have cried with how embarrassed I was, but I just kept reading it. Mm-hmm. And at the end, Neil Hicks said, that is some of the best comedy writing we've ever heard. <laughs> they talk about pain <laughs> plus time, right? Well, I hadn't even had the time to see the humor in it. But it just shows you that what you think you're expressing, somebody else might be getting something quite different based on their worldview or the juxtaposition of what you've put together. So it's all about your delivery and their discovery, and is there a gap there? And and can you? Is that a missed opportunity, or do you need to refine your presentation? Now, and would you agree that sometimes, if you are lucky enough to walk into uh, an office or someone's home, or, or you know, to pitching an investor or something like that, and you haven't had a chance to do your research because you didn't know who that person was, that if you do scan that room and see what they have in the room, like oh, they're Laker fans, oh, they got an autographed picture of Muhammad Ali, oh, they've got, you know, things on the wall, like to kind of like quickly do a profile in your head about them and try to connect or create rapport with them in one way, shape, or form before you even start the pitch even if it's for a couple minutes does that make sense that's actually an age-old uh sales technique called fish on the wall technique Mm -hmm. and you walk in and you see the big marlin on the wall and you go hey did you catch that and it opens up a chance for them to talk about something that they love you may see a photo cube and say oh your son's so cute he plays soccer well yeah now he's in college because that picture is from when they were five or eight or whatever but still you have a frame of reference I often suggest people wear uh, ice breaking jewelry or like your shirt is the the who? Yeah. Who is it? The camp? Yeah, the camp. Yeah, it's just a word. It's something. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, what is it though? Um, it's just a place uh, you work out. Yeah, but I mean, so then I then we begin to have something to talk about and hustle. Indie, your baseball cap, indie film hustle, right? Yeah. So same thing, I'm not wearing anything good, but if I had like a Native American project and I had turquoise jewelry and someone said, oh, I love that. Oh, actually, it's the Anastasi, like boom, and you go right into your story, right? I often try to think of what could I wear that will make them, and good example, I used to go down every year to the Marlin Fishing Tournament in Cabo San Lucas where Mm -hmm. 
lots and lots of millionaires and billionaires are, and he's got 25,000 just to fish, right? So I would carry the bag from last year's tournament so that when I was at LAX and you're in this little teeny terminal going to Cabo San Lucas, everyone knew you were going there. And so by the time you got there, you had met a few people on the plane. You had to switch to a smaller plane. They all knew Cabo San Lucas. They saw the, the Bisbee black and blue. And then by the time you're on the shuttle, which they always stop at someone's house, you know, the, the cousin's gas station for beer, you have made five, six, eight friends before you even got into the hotel. Same thing with like the American film market, Matt P, these things. If you bring last year's bag, and you're at the Lowe's Hotel, people know that you're in that milieu, in that world. So whatever it is that you've got, I wouldn't be wearing costumes, but if you mm. have a T-shirt or a base, yeah, baseball cap, something. But even I have like some really cool um, jewelry from the Isle of Murano that's like glass blown. And then you can talk about, you, you can figure out a way to have an anecdote that drives you to your story. It's just a way to shortcut. I've heard of some of the most horrible pitches I've ever heard. I'd love to hear what <clears throat> one of your ones oh. you've heard. <laughs> but like people like literally dressing up, yeah. sending Chippendale totally. dancers to agents. It, it's not a good thing. And it generally yeah. does not work. If you're just trying to get attention for attention's sake, that kind of stunt stuff, it can work. But from what yeah. I, I mean, again, always if it's done properly if it's done well and it's just generally not done yeah, well. a million uh, examples are going through my head and the two that I, we could talk all day about bad pitches because uh, you know i've done a million pitch fests i planned and organized millions and whatever sure, sure. but um two that come to mind one was a stripper who did a lap dance as part of her pitch okay sure get sure. it it's fine a air. it's a pre me too clearly but <laughs> you think every guy in town wanted to hear that pitch he had no interest in her script so no. she had to schlep around all over town doing lap dances for what like that's that's not going to help you another one this might be incredibly politically incorrect but i will tell you um someone came up to me this was 15 20 years ago and i think it was a female to male transgender and he was saying um, that he didn't want, that it was a true story, it was his story, and he didn't want people taking the meeting just to see what he looked like, right? It was 20 years ago, so it was less, sure. uh, yeah. it was, it was a, uh, more rare then. And I said to him, I said, not to be disrespectful, but I wish I had a hook like that. <laughs> 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 and then the, the guy laughed. He's like, you know what, you're right. Like, it is what it is. Right. It right. is what it is. So it's not the same as the stripper doing it. It's like you get in the room. That's the hook. OK, now is the story there. So there's there's always a hook. There's always an angle there. Like I said, I have a million stories of people who've done good jobs, bad jobs. It is what it is. I, I did one with the Martha's Vineyard Project where I went into pitch to um, I think it was NBC's Blue Sky Network USA. Mm -hmm. So it was USA, and there had there was two different execs I was pitching to, and they each had a different assistant. And so I was doing a lot of coordinating, trying to get the two of them in the room. And so the day that I came, I took uh, chocolate bars from Martha's Vineyard for the two assistants. So it wasn't it was a little brown nosing, but it was kind of project specific. They would remember it was just a thank you. I gave it to them off to the side, and I think little touches like that are very personal. And nice. And then they remember that. So I think there's a lot of things you can do that are within the scope of not just common courtesy, but like I think of um, I lived in Japan a year. They do omiyage where they bring a uh, taste of the season. So that mm -hmm. was bringing a little taste of Martha's Vineyard for this comedy that we were pitching to their bosses. Uh, in my book, I, I actually had went around Hollywood pitching with a mobster, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the, the book I, I wrote a little bit ago. And that was my hook. Like they, exactly. I, I was sitting at the Chateau Marmont with some of the yes. biggest actors in the world purely they because they, exactly. they just wanted to have a dinner or, or a coffee or a drink with the mobster and he never disappointed. Uh, right. <laughs> so right. it, you, you use what you got, I guess. <laughs> That's the same thing. Like I was talking with the transgender guy, like, I'm not I'm not making any kind of a judgment, just that there will be that curiosity, looky-loo, kicking tires, it sucks, but why not use it, 
So mm-hmm. if you've got a, a mafioso that's willing to come with you and schmooze, have at it, right? I don't think it there is a maf- I don't think there is a mafioso that wouldn't come around and schmooze and, 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 yeah. and schmooze in Hollywood. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are definitely pitch worthy without question. Right, now, right. now, how do you research potential buyers for either your screenplay or potential projects? Because a lot of people <laughs> just have no idea where to even begin with just searching who's going to yeah. want this. Yeah. So I cover that real extensively in both books. Um, and probably that's one of my, that's probably my superhero skill is like my dad was a spy and I was almost a spy. So I don't nice. know if you do that. No, I didn't. I I interviewed with the CIA in Arlington, Virginia for a week when I was 19 years old. So my dad was, yeah. So my dad was in the secret service. And so I am like my spidey skills in in research and due diligence. So a couple of things I learned, Uh, unfortunately for Sony, you know, they had that huge leak. Mm -hmm. I did not know this, but this is a terrible uh, tip to give people, but it's true. And you know, once it's on the internet, it's out there forever. If you're trying to track down contact information for someone, like let's say you know it's at CAA.com, like you know yeah. the, the yep. domain name, right? And you know their name. If you put in, like, if you put in Alex Ferrari plus at IndieFilmHustle.com, something like that, and just do a search for that, what I found was a gold line of all the Sony press releases that pulled up that person's name that had whatever their actual email address was below because it came up on all these different documents and now you've got their contact information. So that's better than Variety Insight. That's better than IMDb Pro. It's the stuff they're using internally. So I shouldn't share that because it'll probably I'll scramble to change it, but uh, that's been an amazing resource for contact info. But I also do like, I'm sure, I'm sure you have run into investors who are not investors. No, never. They're all on the up and up. Right, right, right. They all have millions. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. They say, it's only five million. I I don't, that's no problem at all. I could do five million in my sleep. I don't even get up for less. But I can't pick up lunch right now. I can't pick up lunch. And their shoes are cheap from Payless, right? So, not there's anything wrong with pay less shoes. But if you're saying you have five million dollars to invest, you shouldn't have pay less shoes. That's all I'm saying. Because we can have shoes from pay less because we're asking for five million. Exactly. So exactly. So something else I've started to do is put in the name plus scam plus um, scandal plus fraud plus you know and find out because someone somewhere will have said this guy's a total fraud. It's a scam. So using those search terms you know become a world-class internet search person um because you'd be amazed what you find and um and even if you find you know who is it uh zuckerberg Mm -hmm. anyone who has 10 million friends is bound to have a few enemies you're bound to find some dirt on anybody so you can see if it's legit or not you can see that so um but finding out what they've done i i had an example where I won't use I, I won't use any names, but basically somebody tried to bully me and they won into optioning one of my best projects, saying that they had um, uh, produced a little movie called, and then I won't say what it is because it's going to be too easy to track down. But they had produced a little movie called X Y Z, and then when I did some due diligence, they had been the second unit producer, well, second unit oh. line producer. Oh my god. So I had optioned, I should have, at the time, this was pre, like, I should have gone into the bathroom and IMDb'd to see that they were second unit line producer. That's quite different than, even if you're one thing, first line producer, that doesn't mean anything. A wild difference to cut checks out of a checking account that somebody else got money into, right? So just do your due diligence like crazy. And then unfortunately, and, and I found this, if you find someone who has a company name that's really common, odds are they chose it because it's really common and you can never quite suss them out. So you just, ugh, there's so many people playing Hollywood. Like if I could go back in time and clean my calendar of all the people who wasted my time, do you uh. know how much, we have like Pulitzer Prize, Nobel winning projects, right? Because we would have all that time back. So do your due diligence and... You know, pay attention to red flags because red flags don't get better. 
Yes, it's without just, without question. But but I I am I am shocked to hear all these stories about the business. I've never I could never imagine something like that happening. And and right. our business, no, I know. In it's art? in it's art. This is shocking, I, shocking, shocking, shocking. <laughs> that someone, that, and that's the problem is a lot of people are playing Hollywood. Everybody, they want to ninety-five percent, ninety-five percent are playing Hollywood. I would yeah, say. are playing Hollywood. <laughs> so you need to figure out: Are they? I mean, it's one thing. Like, I have respect for the guy who's trying to fund his fluffs breakthrough. Fine, mm -hmm. if you're going to put up money for or whoever, their son, their daughter, if they're going to put up money to get a break for someone. I, I'm all over it. Let's surround them with the best talent. Let's give, like, let's get you your money back. Like, like, let's just be honest about what we're trying to do here. But mm -hmm. it's when the people are playing Hollywood, they don't really have the money. So, you know, I'm a former mortgage banker, so I'm pretty good at tracking down to see if people have the money or not. Because in mortgage banking, you have to do proof of funds. If you ask for a proof of funds, a legit investor will give you proof of funds. Yeah. They may they may walk out the account number. Mm -hmm. They may have it just be a letter of um from the bank manager saying that they have X number of digits. It's none of your business, but just some third party verification. Lots of ways to prove that. So ugh, it's exhausting. I, I could see it in your face just talking about it. You're exhausted yeah. about it. The number, like I was involved <laughs> I'll tell you two things, and then we've got to move on because I'll just get sick to my stomach. <laughs> so I won a Senate commendation from California State Senate for helping San Juan Capistrano stay out of the junk bond scandal when Orange County filed bankruptcy. San Juan Capistrano was the only city to not be dragged through that. Mm -hmm. And so I was the vice president of the Chamber of Commerce. I was really actively involved in saving a historic building, yada, yada, yada. But we saw that coming like a train wreck. Like there are signals. There was also a company, and I'll go ahead and say it because it was a big deal, Quest Financial, mm -hmm. that um, pulled a scam on lots and lots of films. I won't mention them, but they are films you will have heard of. We thought we had $30 million raised. We thought we had money in escrow. Like, And I actually had the FBI call me and say, can oh. you help us? Like, I was involved in that investigation because <laughs> I was the one company that pulled out and said, I said to my partners who are all high profile, I say, I guarantee you, in the 11th hour, they're going to switch escrow companies. So they're going to say there was a problem with the wire. They have to switch escrow companies. And what's going to happen is people who are supposed to put skin in the game have to put just 400000 right? Because you're getting $30 million. This is your skin in the game. You're going to go, and that's going to not be – that building won't be there because there's there will be fraud. So there were, I helped try to help them figure this all out. But unfortunately, not a week goes by. You think of uh, people who are um, – all those internet scams with that you inherited money that all this N stuff Nigerian like, Prince yes Nigerian yes. Prince or even the social security scams that are going on unfortunately it goes on in our business all the time where people say they're going to hire you as a line producer for a project and they're going to wire you money and you need to buy equipment the equipment is going to somebody else that's cash out of your account because the funds bounced so the scams are just they're, massive it's, it's it is exhausting. I'll tell. I'll tell you. I'll tell you my FBI story if you'd like to oh, hear it. Yeah. <laughs> First and we foremost, we got all our acronyms going, right? Yes. So, so, so the <laughs> the worst, and I've never spoken about this on the on any of my shows because it's just never yeah, come up. But it's, it's so not. Long. Yeah. It's not something that you actually you know talk about a lot. But I was called by the FBI, which is not a phone call you want to get because when you get it. You're like, hi, this is the FBI. I'm like, no, who is this? Right, and right, they're like, right. sir, where are the FBI? We're like, oh God. And they're like, were you were you uh, attached to this pro? Did you work on these projects with these producers? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I did. I worked in post. And I just like, we're flying down to interview you. They've been indicted, and we want yes. to see if we're going to use you as a witness. And we just want to hear your side of the story. Not not your side. I'm not in trouble. You're like, but hang on, let me just check with my mafioso, see what my yeah, schedule exactly. is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> This is thankfully years, <laughs> years later, and my documentation of the mafia story, the mafia story has been documented in my book, which is available. I'll find bookstores uh, <laughs> on Amazon as we speak. But this was a completely separate thing. I mean, this is probably about 10 years later. But yeah. man, and then they, I had him come over. We had to sit down and we talked over, over a coffee. 
<laughs> no, no, no. They didn't come to my house. We met at a coffee shop. I'm like, hey, come over, and we and we sat down. And then afterwards, after we felt, they felt that like, okay, this guy was absolutely not involved with anything. And yeah. It was cool. Then of course I'm talking. Uh, then I, of course I'm like, so do you watch the X Files? Area 51. Is it real? Come on, tell me, tell me. And I just, and they just start <laughs> laughing. They just start pissing yeah. themselves. But it, it's a serious thing. Another project that was involved with the director went to yeah. jail because yeah. he defrauded uh, tax um, tax incentives because yeah. he told he told the state that he paid an actor six million dollars when he actually only paid him six hundred thousand dollars. Right, and probably pocketed the difference. <laughs> and, pocket, yeah. and pocketed the difference. And then all of a sudden, he's in jail for five years. But so, that's, also, that's hurting not just the IRS, but it's also hurting your investors. It's yep. hurting the project. It's yep. hurting the star. Everyone's pissed at the star because he's making $6 million when he's only making 600000 Like the, the lies that go backwards oh. and forwards <laughs> is, like I said, exhausting. And, and I will say, not, not just in sales, there is – like we talked about at the beginning, you have to project that you're bigger than you are. You have to buy Payless shoes on the first day and wear them before they get scuffed and fall apart. Like you have to, <laughs> we're, it's all smoke and mirrors. So <clears throat> there are people who are hammering their crew down saying that their budget is 600,000 and they turn around and tell the investor or the distributor that it's a million dollar project. Well, that is Trump, because the, the the distributor will say, well, it's a million dollars. We're only going to give you 600000 Well, now you're good, right? But then the crews find out you're getting, it's a million dollar project. You owe me a quarter more an hour. And then they're striking. Like, it's tough. It's tough. It's to a be balancing. In the middle of all that. It's yeah. a balancing act with that kind of stuff. But yeah. we, ha we have gone off the rails here, uh, which is fan <laughs> but it's fantastic because actually it's all very, very good information for people it's listening. Real. Listen, you know, you, you and I have been around the business for a long time. We've seen a lot a of lot. stuff. And yeah. and I tell you, some people have not, like, I know people right now listening to this podcast, their minds are blown completely by some of the things that you and I take for granted because we've experienced yeah. it so many times. But out there, that's who they're marking. That's their mark, I, the guy or I the girl listening right that, now. I think in the last uh, podcast about the, the thing I overheard at the market, right? Mm -hmm. About them taking, skimming off the top of a SAG bond. No, 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 don't tell us that. So I, I was at the, uh, the American film market and I overheard one distributor training a wet behind the ears, another distributor sales agent, basically saying that the contract should read that they make a commission off all proceeds. So what that means is, is you know how you put up a SAG bond, right? To pay uh -huh. all your actors. Yeah. So let's say that bond is a, a, mil, a million dollars, 200,000, depends on whatever your budget is. Sure. You put up that bond to guarantee SAG after that you will pay your actors. So when that refund of your bond, your savings account that deposit. you had to deposit. deposit that you have allocated to pay payroll comes back through the account, they take a commission off the top of you getting your own deposit back. So you got to, and they're teaching one another how to screw independent filmmakers. So you shocking. just got to watch. I know. Shocking. Isn't shocking. It? I can't, a distributor? Never. I thought they were the, they were the, they were the creme of the creme. Never a distributor. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, <laughs> I, I'm not jaded. I, I love what we do. I love what we do. We are lucky to get to tell stories, to connect. You know, I love it. You just have to pay attention to the daisy chain of middlemen in the middle and the people who are not creators. I also find that with agents and managers and entertainment attorneys, and there's a lot of good ones in the business. But by the time there's one creator to another and there's 12, you know, dominoes in the middle, by the mm -hmm. time the two creators can talk together, they have a shared vision and they want as much as they can get on the screen. They want to be honest to, and authentic to the material. It's all people in the middle who just take a piece off the top. Every time your money changes hands, someone's getting a piece of it. So it's just a tough, tough business. And still we're in it. And we're here, and we're still psychotic enough to do this and on a daily it. basis. And, and, smi and smile about it because we're all psychotic and we're all a little I, bit crazy inside. I, I often say if I won the lottery... I'd wake up and keep doing what I'm doing. Only it'd be a hell of a lot easier, right? I'd, I'd, I'd know exactly what projects I'd be working on and who I'd be hiring. I'd keep doing it. It would just be easier. It'd be a lot. It'd be a lot easier without question. Yeah. Now, do you yeah. have any marketing tips for screenwriters 
and also filmmakers uh, to either b- help them with their own personal brand or the brand of the project. Because I've something like a movie like Kung Fury. I don't know if you ever heard of that movie uh, that yeah. did so well that they're actually doing a feature of it now. That was such a well branded. I mean, so brilliantly branded. It was some guy from Sweden, I think, or something like that, who did it. Um, and then, so that's a, a great example of a of a project branding. But then there's filmmaker branding as well, right. or, or screenwriter branding in general. Like, right. any advice you have for marketing tips on how you can get them out there? Well, it's funny because you know you also it's the flip side of the coin. The more you brand yourself, the more pigeonholed you are, and then you want to shift from a historical biopic to a thriller. And oh, that's not what she writes, you know. So I think. I think um, Jeff Arch, who wrote Sleepless in Seattle, said once at uh, Selling to Hollywood, you get um, nouns and verbs, right? Nouns and verbs. If you're going to use an adjective, they need to be precious. So with you, with your project, with your brand, make sure that you're thinking of your adjectives as almost SEO, search engine optimization words. Like, are you, is it a hip word that's going to, uh, conjure that affinity market, the right age demographic? Is it, are they words that really clearly delineate your worldview, the sensibility? Like if you think of Wes Anderson or you think of John Grisham, I mean, you can think of Stephen King, you can think of some of these people, or you think of like Jane the Virgin, like it's a kind of a campy telenovela with its tongue in its cheek. Like it's really fresh in the now. I mean, it's much, it's been around for a long time. Big Bang Theory, you know, making geeks hot. Like all the different things they did, they, they knew what they were going after and what they were creating. So I think it's the same thing for you. If you have a, pro, a project is easier to brand than a person because the person might want to evolve and change. As in, you know, you look at the Beatles and the different influences they incorporated as mm. they evolved, right? Yeah. So music from India, like whatever it was that they were doing, they were evolving. So I think it's important that you make sure that what you're, the, the niche you're carving out for that project is really crystal clear to that niche. And that's a huge part of the collaborative process and making sure you're all making the same movie. Right. You know, even in a writer's group that you don't have people trying to tug it and tell their story with your script. Like what is the story you're trying to tell and make sure you honor that vision and then beyond that, um, how do you communicate that? And even, you know, I've done some faith-based things that are not um, necessarily Christian faith-based, mm-hmm. but you want to not alienate people who aren't feeling that. So, you know, how can you kind of play down some elements so that you can get these pieces of the puzzle and then play up those benefits to other people? So it's what... What are the pieces of the puzzle? Same thing with ethnicity. You know, I, I always try, I have a couple projects now where the characters are like Jordan or mm-hmm. Chris. Could be a girl or a guy. Mm-hmm. Could be black, white, Asian, Native American. Like, I'm cool with that. So I try to like write colorblind, unless it's really important that it's a ginger Scotsman, right? right like right. it's got to be something that that woman has to be middle-aged or postmenopausal. To, that that's what the story is. Mm-hmm. So whatever the issue is. But otherwise, can you be colorblind in your writing and your casting so that now if you're, gonna, if you're pitching that to an African-American woman to play the lead, that same pitch package could go to an Asian guy to play that same role because it's a thriller and they are an agent or whatever. Mm-hmm. So how do you... How are you, it it's all comes down to who you're pitching to and why. What are you trying to get out of them? You know, are you trying to get them to, to fall in love with that role? Are you trying to get them to feel like they're going to make their money back? Are you trying to get them to open their doors after hours for a location? Like, what is the reason you're, what are you trying to do with that? Excellent. Now, I also want to ask you, because you're out there and you're you're in the, in the trenches, as they say. Uh. What's easy? I know, right? <laughs> What's um? I don't one of these days want to not be in the trenches. I want to be like up at the Cannes Film Festival on the balcony, not in the trenches or on a yacht somewhere. But yeah, I'm in the trenches. Hey, I can sen- okay. I can I can sense that from you. I can sense it. we all want to be at the top of the mountain with Spielberg and Cameron yeah. and all these kind of guys who could just do whatever they want whenever they want. But until that day comes. We're right. here huffing it. Yes, um, yeah. So as 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 we are here down in the trenches. These are the good old days. We just don't know it yet, right? <laughs> exactly. This. These are the stories <laughs> that we'll tell. These are the stories right. that we'll tell on the yacht. Uh, the, 
know. But anyway, so TV projects or feature film projects, what's the better, what's a good market right now? What's, where's the most opportunity or in general, what is, where is there the most opportunity for content creators, screenwriters, filmmakers to make it a dent? Well, I haven't, I, I have an opinion, not advice. Okay. So I've got lots of opinions. (laughs) I think no one knows. And if I knew I'd have a crystal ball and we would be on that yacht having a really fine wine (laughs) right now. So I'm not saying I'm the Oracle. I have my opinions and my opinion is uh, film and television. When I first wrote the first book, you know, my book proposal said that film and television were converging and 11 people thought that was really uh, insightful. And one person's like, no, they're not. They're totally different business models. They're totally different. No. They're converging. They're so converging. It's so seamless now. A viewer doesn't care how that content got to them, whether it was satellite or, you know, coaxial cables or cell service. They don't care if it's on an iPhone screen, a big screen. Uh, there were screens that home, some cinemas at home are as good as they are, even better than some of the Cineplex at the mall. So, that convergence is pretty incredible. What everyone wants, remember in the old days with websites where they called it sticky, a sticky website? Mm-hmm. They want sticky TV now. And is what is TV? Is TV cable broadcast? Is it streaming? Like, what is it? It's just content. It's all content. And so what they want is whether they're ad-supported, whether they're subscription-supported models, whether they are, um, you know, all, all, there's so many different models now. What they want is addictive, binge-worthy, marquee value stuff. And so I think the biggest opportunity at the moment is limited event series, anthology series, it's serial programming, whether it's episodic, like look at Black Mirror, or which only did three episodes, I guess, in their next season, which is kind of odd. Um, but who cares? Like it's whatever the stories require. So is it, or like Twilight Zone, they're rebooting, you know, these kinds of anthology series where the brand American Horror Story, True Detective, the genre unifies them. And you know that you can come back week after week and get that kind of thing. Who knows who's going to be starring in it or like one hour dramas and serials. You're, your Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, you know, Hulu just won its first Emmy for Handmaid's Tale. So all of these things, they want people who are going to be loyal and come back, whether it's appointment viewing or binge viewing or just wanting to talk about it because the, we've had this nonlinear time shift where people don't talk around the water cooler anymore, right? Because no. you could have seen all of Game of Thrones and I might not have seen any of it. So how do we, how do we engage on that? And that's what's happening with your, your got talents all around the world is it's live. They want this. It's either got to be live and you have to be this that fear of missing out. We're talking about, you know, so again, it depends. Is it reality? It documentaries are having a total resurgence of Renaissance now um, because it's easier to find these things. So I think mm-hmm. again, it's all about identifying your target audience and being authentic and true to the, the material. And there's some series out there where one episode is 11 minutes and another one is 44. It's whatever the story needed to be for that chapter. So we have so much freedom as storytellers today. And with the fragmentation of the dial, I, I often think of millennials going, what dial? Right? What's a dial? What's a dial? Like they don't even know. They don't even have this frame of reference. So we have to be able to shift with that and know that at the end of the day, People like there's so many jobs in our industry and around the world in every industry that are being taken over by robots. It's tough for a robot to tell a story. Yeah, you know they can, but not well. They can't. They can, but it's all based on older people's. uh, I saw AI doing it. There was. I I have a whole episode on uh, coming up about that, like AI and and how it. it, They wrote it, but it's all algorithm based, and it's all based on old scripts. Right. And it's just not. It's, and, it's not there. Yeah, so that's what I think. I don't even know if I'm answering the question now, but I'm interested in what we're talking about. You no, know, no, no, it's, I got you. No, you, 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 made a, you made a very good answer to it. But it's being tapped into not just the zeitgeist that's current, but what mm-hmm. matters to you. Like what's frustrating to you, what pisses you off, what's inspiring to you. Because if you're authentic and real about that, you're going to find others for whom that's true as well. And the more you can stay stick to the truth, 
the more like specific it is, the more universal it is. So I think, I think we're at an amazing time. And I think if you just keep sticking to your guns and stay in the trenches and keep hustling and huffing, you know, good, good work rises to the cream of the crop. Now tell me a little bit about the book. We've talked a lot about stuff inside the book, but just tell us exactly what the book is. Where can people find it? When is it available? Uh, it's called Story Selling, How to Develop, Market, and Pitch Your Film and TV Projects. It's a Michael Weezy book, and it's there's a link on my website, heatherhale.com forward slash story selling, that it's a pre-order on Amazon. So they actually, you can order it now, but they don't ship till July. So it's done. It's ready to go. So I don't know what happens in that process of mm-hmm. How hard is it to hit print, right? And for right. whoever to like get it to you. But it's coming out, and uh, I have had a lot of people read it. And like I said, not to toot my own horn, but it's it's really good. I'm really proud of it. I think I have had people who've been in the business 30 years who are like, I would read this for every project. So I'm really pleased with that. And people who've never written anything are like, oh, okay, this is it's not rocket science, and it's not color by numbers either. Right, but right. there are some steps. And there's some things to think about. And there's a lot of fantastic books out there on everything under the sun. But I didn't feel like there was a book out there that explained these things that we're all scrambling to create all the time. Pitch decks, series Bibles, Ripomatics. Like, what are these words? How do you pull them together? And do you need a treatment for every project? Like, like, and what are the, what order do they get done in? So, and, and it's, I talk a lot about, like, you know, it's the affinity backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. It's, it's a never ending process and it can be development hell or it can be, um, I talk about, you know, reduction sauce. You take this huge soup terrain and reduce everything down, take great, fantastic ingredients and get to the essence of each of those elements and let them shine. And that's what you're trying to do. And I, I also think of like kindergarten rooms with Feng Shui, like everything should have a place at, you know, mise en place, mise en scene, everything's got a mm-hmm. place. And, Do you have all the pieces you need, all the elements, so that somebody can help you achieve your dream? Give them the pieces they need to sell on your behalf. Now I'm going to ask you questions I ask all of my guests. I should remember this. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Get a job. (laughs) Get a real job. What are you doing? I would not. I would not. Get a job in the business. I would say as a good piece of advice. It's not not a bad advice. I would say. you know, write what you know or write what you need to know, like follow that process of discovery so that you're writing stuff that you would want to watch. Uh, Surround yourself with really fantastic people. Trust your gut instincts. If you, if someone makes your skin crawl, run. And if you really (laughs) enjoy someone and they improve your writing or they improve, they're a good collaborator, like spend time with people that, you know, these Productions can be, as you well know, just hellacious and grueling. Uh, right. So you want to be surrounded by people who make you laugh, who make you feel good about yourself, who make you step to the plate to create the best work. Don't surround yourself with naysayers and people who make you question yourself and, and are hypercritical. I mean, it's all about people at the end of the day, not just the people you're working with and not just um, you know the people you're accountable to, whether they're investors or distributors. But also think about what you're putting out into the communal consciousness. Like, is that something that you want to be part of your legacy? Like, really think about that. You know, put out their images that you want out there. I think people often try to count out to the to the market and what they think is good. But how about what we wish was good? What we Ooh, wish was out there. That was you know? that, that was that was good. I like that one. That was that was a, that was good. That, that was a good one. I like that one. That was actually really really good. Oh, now. Good. I have- <laughs> yeah, that was it. This, uh, the rest of it was crap. Okay. But this, right. no. Um, <laughs> no, that was actually really cool. Um, can you tell me a book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Oh, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't because it'll <clears throat> reveal my politics. <clears throat> um, Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, and The Fountainhead. <laughs> I'm a libertarian through and through. <laughs> Fair so enough. Fair she's enough. Amazing. But, you know, she came from Russia and she, just, you know, so I don't know that we're that we have the American dream right now or real capitalism or real democracy, but what, what we hoped it would be, mm-hmm. you know, that's pretty pure in that. And I know there's people who can't stand her. Hey, so, uh, everyone's got every, like, I asked you a question. What was the book that impacted you? And that was the book and that's all good. Yeah. Um, now what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? 
I'm probably still learning it. Mm -hmm. Um, well, there's several things I would, I guess one of them is life's not fair. You know, I keep (laughs) wishing, I mean, that's it. It's real. I wish life was fair and it's not, it's not a meritocracy. You know, the best person doesn't always win. And sometimes it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how hard you want it. Life isn't fair and it sucks, but you just gotta keep, you gotta keep Russell. You gotta keep hustling. Okay, hold on. If only life was fair. Oh my gosh! Well, there'd yeah, be better. That, there'd be a lot better movies in the world. That. Let's write that comedy and that thriller. If life were fair. Um, now and what is? Were fast. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> now, what is the biggest fear you've had to overcome in in your career just to kind of make those first few projects? Oh well, a million. Of course, I think everybody has the "I'm not good enough." Yes, right? imposter, imposter syndrome. So I'm not worried about that issue. Um, I think a huge part of it, I this is probably way too truthful, but it's just coming to me. Um, I'm not married because I have suffered so many betrayals and divorces professionally that I'm in a happily committed 11-year solid, rock-solid romance. But I think I'm just so, I feel like I've been divorced 25 times. You know I know me? the feeling. Right? Right? It's just... Feeling. I no. don't look when I, you're with a project for three, four, five years yeah. and you, and you keep in like, Oh, it's almost, almost there. It's oh no, it's almost there. It's almost, almost there. Oh, the money's about to drop. It's, it's the rug keeps getting pulled out from under you. You thought they had a ring on it. Like every time, like I had a project, I was in a pay or play offer and the first check had cleared and the contract was signed and it fell apart and I didn't get either pay or play. Like, how does that happen? Why is life not fair? Like, I vetted everybody like I, I every project I get a step further and then uh, t- like like there's a million ways to get screwed in this business and I've been screwed by all of them and I just keep thinking I've run out of them and the next one like I so I don't know I don't know what the lesson is there but you just have to again ha- have people in your life that you can turn to who can help you see the irony and the life lessons and the comedy in the shit that we put up with like there's always a pony there maybe there it's just not in that room <laughs> right know. right or if it, or it's just a, it's a couple guys in a horse outfit we're, we're in like <laughs> um Horton here's a who and we're looking in all the wrong rooms that are full of shit like there's a right. pony here somewhere i don't know where it is but well, I'm glad this turned into a therapy session. I'm glad I could help uh, you yeah. with this. <laughs> no, listen, listen. I actually, I absolutely feel you. I feel I've had so many projects fall apart, and yeah. but for whatever reason, we're still, we're still here. here. And we, and then I don't know if that says something about the business or us, or but both. or both. I you know, think if, you know, Gone with the Wind. When Scarlett O'Hara is standing there, and it's I think it's Civil War, Civil War, Revolution. It's Civil yeah, War. It's, it's uh, Civil War. Civil War, and there's all. Oh, all oh, those dead soldiers yeah, and they're just, rolling and they're up their sleeves and blowing. That's us, man, in Hollywood, right? <laughs> and you look around and you're like, I recognize him from 20 years ago. And I used to hate her guts, but she's a trooper. She's still here. We're going to be friends. Like you just, at some point you see who the survivors are and that's us, man. That's us. You know what? And uh, it's so true. And I hope, I mean, I hope we have not scared off a whole gaggle of people Sorry, listening to this episode. All your viewers or your listeners. No, but you know what? This it's is, true. but this is the truth of the business. And I'm always like my, my mantra is follow your dream, but don't be an idiot. And it's, right. it's like, I'm all about the positivity and the motivation. You've got to go for it, but you have to be aware of what's out there. And that was the main purpose I even opened up Indie Film Hustle and Bulletproof Screenplay or Bulletproof Screenwriting in the first place because I wanted this kind of information out there because yeah. it's not taught in schools. It's generally not in books. It's stuff that you hear about in at the, the yeah. at, at drinks at AFM or and in a coffee shop. And you never hear the whole truth. Either, the whole truth. Know each other. Yeah. It, exactly. You, you're lucky enough to overhear a conversation like this. And that's why I wanted to bring people like you on the show. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm grateful for your honesty and candor. Well, I'm grateful that you're out there doing this. And t- I'm not <laughs> to listen to the other ones of your episodes. I mean, they're great. So I'm honored to be on here. And I hope, I hope I said stuff that was cathartic to people who feel like idiots because you're not an idiot. Like it's yeah. happening to the people the people who got screwed in that other deal were third generation filmmakers. Oh yeah, it happens to everybody. It happens to everybody. I thought, you know what? They've got credits I would be I'd kill to have and I saw it coming. And not that I my nose hasn't been kicked in many times, but 
you, you see them again and their patterns you can recognize. So just, it's not fair. It sucks. Get over it. And, no, and, you got, and you protect got, you, yourself and write great stuff and do and, stuff that makes it at the end of the day worth it. Yes. yes. Right. That at the end of all of this, you didn't write some schlock and you didn't throw together some piece of shit that someone else could have done. Like make it worth worthwhile. Without question. Um, and I have yeah. one last question. Three yes. of your favorite films of all time. Oh, well, always Shawshank Redemption has oh, always been. Oh, yes. It's my I top can't. as well. I oh. think it's my number one. Uh, recently booted from, I, I think I need to do a list where you have the, how long they've been on the list. Sure, sure, the sure. brand new one is Greatest Showman. I, lo I actually I, really enjoy Greatest Showman. I, I loved it. I loved that. Yeah. Loved it. And then uh, there's a bunch that would be neck and neck for third. And in there would for sure be um, Waking the Divine. I love Waking the Divine. It's such and a brilliant little film. Big Fish. I is love in Big there. Fish. Yeah, Tim Burton. And there's a one. There's a million of them. I have a list. I did a list on my website, top ten films, and at 231, I had to stop. So <laughs> now I just go I, in and sometimes update the top ten. But I, yeah, it's. I always tell people if if you haven't seen Shawshank Redemption or if you don't wa if you don't like Shawshank Redemption, you are dead inside, and we can't have right. a conversation. I'm, right. I've I've yet to meet someone who didn't like Shawshank Redemption, and even if they did, if they heard me say these things, they probably wouldn't admit it to it. But yeah. but every time, by the way, anyone listening, anytime I get a bad review or someone doesn't like something I do, this is all I Google: bad review Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> and they exist. And you read yeah. these things, and they were from big big reviewers right. and you just sit there going wow but that's just... interesting though Shawshank is a really good example um I'm, I'm not gonna say bad branding or marketing it was bad it was it was bad branding okay. horrible title I did not want to see Shawshank Redemption no. I had no interest in seeing this no. police or the jail drop like uh. zero interest yes. it came out everyone talked about it there was I had no interest it took me like a year and a half to see yeah. Shawshank Redemption yeah. and when I did I can't tell you how many times I've seen it so that is Oh. That makes me feel better. Again, bad branding, bad advertising, bad marketing, whatever it was. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter because it was so mm, 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 good. It, it right? is. And it's played and a thousand times a day. Stuff like that. It won't matter if it's poorly branded. It won't matter. All the other stuff, just write shit like Shawshank. That's my advice. <laughs> That's the best advice. shit like Shawshank. <laughs> she, she still seashells on the seashore sure, yes like shawshank <laughs> like shawshank uh heather where can people find you and your work and your and your stuff that you do uh heatherhale.com and heather at heatherhale.com i thought a long time ago just brand you because you're gonna have, wear lots of hats right yep. and um you don't even the the two books are how to work the film and tv markets which is by focal press which is a guide for content creators and the other is story selling how to develop market and pitch your film and TV projects. And my best film and TV projects are ahead of me. They yes. are coming, right? Yes. You don't need to watch anything else. <laughs> <laughs> we have learned and we're moving forward. Yes, mistakes were made, but now we're moving forward. Yes, yes. <laughs> were taken. Heather, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank and, you. and thank you for dropping such honest knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So I I'm appreciate sure that. I'm sure I will through the day and regret it, but <laughs> that's who I am. My biggest fault. And thank there's you. plenty to choose between. Thank you, Heather. Thank you.